This is KD-3987. Hopper, can, can you read me or the base station? 10-4, our broadcast is on the air at this time. And uh, we might point out that the crowd's getting a big kick uh, out of uh, one thing that's happening here at downtown Dallas at the present time, and that is uh, we heard a big cheer go up from the direction opposite the one the president was uh, scheduled to approach from. And uh, here comes this uh, elderly-looking automobile with uh, various different uh, paintings all over it for Honest Joe's Pawn Shop. And he's got a great big sign on the side that says JFK. And you can hear the crowd for Honest Joe's Pawn Shop tribute to, uh, to JFK. And uh, <laughs> that's one interesting sidelight. The crowds are still getting bigger here in downtown Dallas. The motorcade is still not in sight. This is Bob Upker again at Main and Ackert at downtown Dallas. And the first red lights are now visible coming uh, far down the street, uh, just having now turned right hand uh, onto Main off of Harwood. And the uh, large uh, police escort is now ahead of the presidential uh, motorcade. Buses are pulled over to the side of the street and the crowd is surging forward to uh, close in somewhat on the leading cars, there are five, six, seven motorcycles still here in front of the first cars. Uh, and the crowd at our point is surging forward. There's a big cheer going up as the uh, president gets further down. And now the ticker tape and uh, other confetti and such is beginning to flow from the windows uh, all over the uh, large uh, buildings here and uh, engulf the entire uh, motorcade. Here comes the first car with Police Chief Jess Curry and uh, Sheriff Bill Decker. And here is the President of the United States. And what a crowd, uh, what a tremendous welcome he's getting now. We can, uh, and there's Jackie. She's getting just as big a welcome. And the crowd is absolutely going wild. This is a friendly crowd in downtown Dallas as the President and the First Lady pass by. There is Linda Johnson and Lady Bird passing by in the second car behind Moore. And here come the Congressmen and their automobiles. And there comes the press. They're shooting the entire crowd as they move along here. Here is KRLD's cameraman Jim Underwood along with others and more press people coming by. As we can see, the presidential limousine even further down the street. It's a tremendous welcome, not a placard in downtown Dallas. And here comes the White House press. Uh, the big chartered uh, bus is now arriving. And uh, more limousines. The entire motorcade is now being, as we can see, the rear of it. It's uh, the crowd's closing in behind the motorcade. And up ahead of the motorcade, far down uh, the street towards Simmons Freeway, we can see the crowd is absolutely going wild, and there's more ticker tape falling out of the, the windows. There are people absolutely uh, looking from every window here in downtown Dallas. And it was a wonderful welcome as the President and Jacqueline Kennedy uh, passed our point at uh, Main and Ackert. The latter part of the motorcade has just passed, and now the entire Main Street is completely filled from building to building with people, and they're following the motorcade uh, down towards Simmons Freeway. The people really enjoyed that one glimpse of the President of the United States and Jacqueline Kennedy. They're going further down, and just about now, as we can see, far, far down uh, Main Street towards Simmons Freeway, the motorcade is just about to reach the uh, location of the county courthouse. And the people are still running down Main Street following the presidential motorcade. The enthusiastic welcome that uh, broke loose here at Main and Akron has followed the president all the way through. And thousands and thousands of people who were crowding the streets here are following the motorcade even further down uh, Main Street towards Simmons Freeway. It uh, was a wonderful welcome for President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy. There was... Uh, Certainly uh, no adverse demonstration. It was a tremendous welcome that Big D gave our chief executive. The presidential motorcade is now just uh, far, far, uh, out, almost out of our sight, and the only thing still visible above the heads of uh, thousands upon thousands of people who are still following the motorcade down Main Street towards Simmons Freeway, just the very top of the big buses carrying the official party and the congressman as well as the White House press. It was a tremendous welcome here in Main and Ackard and all along Main Street in downtown Dallas. And now gradually the crowd is uh, beginning to thin out at our location and uh, we can see a little bit of traffic beginning to move uh, far down to the east on Main Street. And those who are following the presidential caravan are just about out of sight now too and most of the crowd at our point 
are going back to their respective jobs and wherever they have to be on this particular afternoon. By the way, this uh, tour of Texas did bear, of course, definite political overtones in spite of its non-political billing. And uh, apparently there was a great deal of respect and political support evident for the chief executive and the first lady in their tremendous welcome here in downtown Dallas. There were no hooters, there were no jeers, and there were no hecklers as the president passed. Of course, the presidential visit is seen by some observers as an effort to bring together these warring factions of the Democratic Party in Texas. Some controversy surrounded each of the president's stops in the uh, state, but at present, most seem to have been cleared up. Senator Ralph Yarbrough has been awarded a seat at the head table at uh, today's noon luncheon at the trade mart, and this has apparently satisfied liberal elements of the Democratic organization in Dallas. Dallas uh, liberal Baxton Bryant and a number of others had launched strong opposition to the conservative leanings in uh, ticket distribution at today's luncheon, but it all seems to be straightened out now. Relations have been uh, less than cordial also, of course, between Senator Yarbrough, who is seeking uh, re-nomination, and Governor Connolly, who uh, is opposed to a third Senate term. But, uh, of course, these things having, having been ironed out, a wonderful welcome having been given to the president here in downtown Dallas. It was, a, it was quite a spectacle one that Dallas won't see for a long time to come. And any fears that might have existed in the minds of some about uh, the alleged small handful of people who might have uh, launched severe demonstrations to mar the president's visit, these were uh, apparently unjustified or at least taken care of in uh, good order by the Dallas Police Department who had such a tremendous force in evidence at the uh, downtown uh, areas and all over the city of Dallas as the motorcade moved through that there was uh, no danger whatsoever and none in evidence of adverse uh, reactions to the president's visit. A completely overwhelming welcome for the president. Now this is Bob Huffaker in downtown Dallas returning you to Jay Hogan at uh, KRLD studio. That winds up the more than one hour long broadcast of the arrival of the president from Fort Worth to Dallas, uh, the motorcade uh, downtown which is now uh, wending its way up uh, Stemmons and will be at the Trade Mart in a matter of minutes. And KRLD will pick up the broadcast later in the afternoon after resuming our regular program. One note, the president telephoned his congratulations to John Nance Garner from Fort Worth today on the occasion of the former vice president's 95th birthday. The call coming as a 15-minute public ceremony in front of Garner's simple white frame house at Uvalde. Stand by after uh, resuming the regular program. KRLD will bring you another broadcast direct from the Trade Mart. This is KRLD News. This is KRLD, AM and FM, Dallas, CBS Radio for Dallas Fort Worth. We continue our regularly scheduled program with Back to the Bible in progress. Asking those of you that are living quite a distance. Which just occurred in Dallas, Texas, where President Kennedy is visiting. President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly of Texas were both hit by a would-be assassin's bullets as they toured down, down Dallas in an open automobile a short while ago. That is the latest word that has just come in from Dallas on United Press International. Uh, the Associated Press, in its first report, says that President Kennedy was shot just as his motorcade left downtown Dallas. Mrs. Kennedy, who was riding with him, jumped up and grabbed Mr. Kennedy and cried, Oh, no. The motorcade sped on. Riding in the same car with the president for this particular motorcade was Governor and Mrs. John B. Connolly, the governor of the state of Texas. According to the last report, both the president and the governor were hit by the bullets. And now one more ad has come in. The president, his limp body cradled in the arm of his wife, was rushed to Parkland Hospital. The governor was also taken to Parkland. Clint Hill, a Secret Service agent assigned to Mrs. Kennedy, escorted the president into the hospital, and we are awaiting further word on his condition. We will repeat these details as they have come into us here in our New York News headquarters. A would-be assassin fired at the presidential automobile in Dallas a short while ago, hitting both President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly. President Kennedy was cradled in his wife's arms as the car sped off to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Both the president and Governor Connolly have been taken into the hospital for emergency treatment. 
An Associated Press photographer, James Altkin, said he saw blood on the president's head. He said he heard two shots but thought someone was shooting fireworks until he saw the blood on the president. The photographer, Altkin, said that he saw no one with a gun at the time. These are the details we have so far on this situation. We are awaiting further information that might come in by telephone or via the Press Association wires to our news headquarters here in New York. The president, as you know, was on a three-day tour of the state of Texas. He flew down yesterday and was preparing to make an appearance and a speech today in Dallas before flying on to the state capital of Austin for an appearance this evening. We will repeat the information we have of now. Both President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly have been wounded by uh, an assassin's bullet. We do not know the condition of either man. Both have been taken to Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. This is the latest we have at our CBS News headquarters in New York. We now resume our regularly scheduled program. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. As I read this, I just thought, how foolish Daniel would have been if he had appeared. Interrupt this program now for a special report from Jim Underwood at the scene of the shooting. Report from Jim Underwood at the scene of the shooting. I'm uh, now in the courthouse on the street. I was uh, in a car, seven cars behind the president during the parade from Love Field through downtown Dallas. As the car I was in made the turn at Elm and Houston and started down for the triple underpass, I heard three loud shots seemingly from right over my head. Uh, there was so much confusion with people running, I thought at first that some of the spectators farther down the street toward the Elm Street underpass had been hit. I saw many of them throw themselves flat on the ground, and the police officers started blowing whistles and running for the scene. I leaped out of the car I was in in the parade and ran for the scene also. Then the chase, and it actually was not a chase at the time, but the crowd started streaming through the railroad yards just past the Texas School Book Depository building. They searched through train cars and through the road yards could find no one and then the police officers found an 11 year old colored boy named Eunice that was his last name who said that he looked up after the first shot and saw a colored man lean out of about the fourth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository building and fire two more shots. Uh, the police are now surrounding the area down here. Sirens are screaming and evidently police believe that the man who fired the shots is still in the Texas School Book Depository building at the corner of Elm and Houston in downtown. We return you now to our regular program. Man of God. So he handled the innkeeper with this same spirit. This is the, they weren't playing games. They really meant to get rid of him. And if they had their way, they were sure enough going to kill him. And so they had him thrown into a den of lions. But the angel of the Lord interfered and kept Daniel that night. And the story went, you know, the king was upset about the... <laughs> we interrupt this program for a CBS Radio Net Alert Bulletin. This is Alan Jackson reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York with more details on the incident which just occurred in Dallas a short while ago where President Kennedy has been wounded by a would-be assassin. He and Texas Governor Connolly were shot from ambush as their motorcade drove through Dallas shortly after the president arrived in the city on the second day of his tour. So far, there is no indication of how seriously either man was injured. Both were lying flat in their car as the automobile sped off to a hospital, both men have been taken to the Park Lane Hospital in Dallas for treatment. Uh, the incident occurred just east of the triple underpass facing a park in downtown Dallas. Reporters in the motorcade with the presidential party were about five car lengths behind the chief executive's car at the time. It had been difficult to tell immediately whether the First Lady and Mrs. Connolly, who were riding in the same car, might have been injured. They were holding their husbands as the car rushed off to the hospital and we are still waiting more details on just what went on there. Secret service agents in a follow-up car quickly unlimbered their automatic rifles. They drew their pistols but the damage had been done. One of our correspondents on the scene is now 
in contact with us. So let's switch now to news correspondent Dan Rather in Dallas. Dallas police have just confirmed that Texas Governor John Connolly also was shot at the same time as President Kennedy as the two men rode in the same car in a motorcade from downtown Dallas toward the Dallas trademark where President Kennedy was to have made a speech. Pandemonium broke out at the scene of the shooting as three shots emerged from somewhere in the crowd. The crowd along the route of the motorcade was four and five lines deep. At the time of the shooting, the motorcade was passing at least three buildings, more than three stories. One child, aged seven, told authorities that he saw a man lean out of the fifth floor of one of the buildings and fire the shots. Police and Secret Service agents now have that building surrounded and are going through the building in a systematic search. Still, another witness at the scene said this man was an adult, said he thought he saw a man and a woman crawling along a walkway over the motorcade route, and that this adult said it was possible that that man and woman could have fired the shots. Dallas police say they have no information on the condition of either President Kennedy or Texas Governor John Connolly. Several reporters who were in the motorcade said that Mr. Kennedy had blood on his head as he was taken into an ambulance and rushed to Dallas' Parkland Hospital just a few blocks from the trademark where he was to have made the speech. This is Dan Rather in Dallas, Texas. That's the latest from one of our team of correspondents with the presidential party in Dallas. We will be getting additional details from minute to minute as we continue here. The shooting took place at 1.45 Eastern Time. That was just about a little over 10 minutes ago. President Kennedy apparently was shot in the head. He fell face down in the back seat of his car, and there was blood on his head. Mrs. Kennedy, riding in the car with him, shouted, Oh, no, and tried to hold up her husband's head. Riding in the same car were Governor Connolly and Mrs. Connolly. Governor Connolly also was hit. We are not have no information on how seriously either man has been hurt. Connolly remained half-seated, but slumped to the left when he was shot. There was blood on his face and forehead. Both the president and the governor were rushed to Parkland Hospital near the Dallas Trade Mart, where President Kennedy was to have made a speech today. As you know, this was the middle day of his three-day tour of Texas. He spoke in Texas last night. He arrived in Dallas only a short while ago, was to make a speech at the trademark there in a short while, and then go on to the state capital of Austin for a reception and a fundraising dinner this evening. The shooting took place within minutes after the presidential party arrived in Dallas. There are no details on just how it occurred. Secret Service men and Dallas police, as we have heard from correspondent Rather, have one building surrounded where they think the would-be assassins may have been located. Some of the Secret Service agents thought <coughs> the gunfire they heard was from an automatic weapon fired to the right rear of the chief executive's car, probably from the grassy knoll to which motorcycle policemen directed their attention as they raced up the slope. And a late word... Texas Congressman Albert Thomas says he has been informed that both President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are still alive after having been shot in an assassination attempt. That is the first word we have had to that effect. Congressman Thomas says he has been informed that President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are both still alive after the shooting attempt a short while ago. Thomas, standing outside the corridor of the emergency room in which both the President and Connolly are under treatment, said... He has been told the president is still alive, but is in a very critical condition. President Kennedy is in a very critical condition after the attempted assassination in Dallas, Texas, less than a quarter of an hour ago. The security police have the one building surrounded where, according to one report, the assassins may have been planning their ambush. There is one other report that a man and a woman were seen on a grassy knoll overlooking the motorcade route, and that perhaps that was a, the ambush spot. Details are still scarce. The situation was a turmoil, as would be understandable, uh, immediately after the shooting took place. When the president was taken into the emergency room, a call was sent out immediately for some of the top surgical specialists in Dallas. As we mentioned a moment ago, the president was shot in the head. He fell 
back in his car and blood could be seen on his head. And a call was also sent out for a Roman Catholic priest. This is a standard procedure in serious operations of this type and is not to be taken as indicating the expected fate of the president yet. Our last report was that he and the governor are both still alive in the hospital emergency room after the shooting. The call has gone out for surgical specialists to treat the governor and the president. Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth says that uh, both men were seriously wounded in the shooting, but that they are alive. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was in a car behind the president. There is no immediate indication that he was hurt. As a fact, there's no indication at all of what it might have happened to Johnson since only the president's car and its Secret Service follow-up car went to the hospital in the initial drive. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt CBS momentarily for a local bulletin with Joe Scott. Thank you. We're down here at the scene of the current manhunt that must be over. Two dozen squad cars blocking the intersection of Elm and Houston Street. Steve Parringer just returned from the building where they think they have this man surrounded or where he shot from and they found four shells on the... What floor was it on, Steve? No, uh, Jerry Hill with the Dallas Police Department just leaned out a window there. It looked to me like he was on the fourth floor and told police to call the Dallas Crime Laboratory to the scene. Apparently they found some shells there in that room uh, here in the Texas School Book Depository building at Elm and Field Street. So other police officers currently have the scene surrounded while still more with shotguns are searching out the building at this time. But there have been some shells found, I believe, on the fourth floor in the police crime lab currently en route to the scene as the search continues. All right, this building, the window from which they were fired from, is a block away from the president's uh, motorcade route. Elm, Main, and Commerce are the streets he was on Main. This building is on Elm. They have brought uh, the fire department rescue squad to the scene. We now have uh, several witnesses being taken to Sheriff Bill Decker's office for further questioning. A fire truck is here. They're fixing to put a ladder up to the building to continue their search at this point. So far, no one has been apprehended, but more than a score of Dallas policemen are standing with riot guns or shotguns poised on their hip, ready and looking upward. This is Joe Scott from the scene now returning you to KRLD News. Further reports when they're available. And now to CBS. Gave reporters a description of what he saw as the president was shot and as his car followed the presidential limousine from downtown Dallas to the hospital. Senator Yarborough told newsmen that he heard three shots. He did not see where they come, came from, but he thought he heard three. He said he then saw a Secret Service man beating his fist on the president's limousine. Senator Yarborough told newsmen it was too horrible to describe, but he did tell uh, reporters that both Governor Connolly and the president were gravely injured. He said that the president appeared to have been shot in the head. Senator Yarbrough, as we say, was three cars back from the president's car. He said his limousine followed to the hospital. He only saw the attendants at the hospital carrying the president into the hospital. Thus far, no report, as we know from here, on his exact condition. This is Nelson Benton outside Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas. One further report has come into our news headquarters here in New York by the Associated Press quoting the Secret Service is saying that the president remains in the emergency room and that the governor has been moved to the general operating room of Parkland Hospital. One Secret Service man was overheard telling another that there was no need to move the president because emergency facilities are entirely adequate in the emergency room where he is located. We have a report um, now from one more of our correspondents on the scene. Our White House correspondent who was accompanying the president here is CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint in Dallas. President Kennedy's condition here at Parkland Memorial Hospital is apparently quite serious. Two priests reportedly have just gone in to be with the president, and according to Senator Ralph Yarborough, who was in the motorcade, the president's condition is serious. As far as we know, here is what happened. At 12.30 today, as the presidential motorcade was 
making its way through the crowded streets of Dallas, two or three shots rang out. The president's car immediately sped away, and we learned later the president and Governor Connolly of Texas had been wounded. We think the president was hit in the head. We are not sure. I repeat, two priests have gone in to be with the president. The situation looks extremely serious. This is Robert Pierpoint at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Our news bureau in Washington has reported that the Senate has recessed and that Senator Ted Kennedy, the youngest of the Kennedy brothers, was presiding over the Senate when the news was, was received. Kennedy, according to a member of his staff, was still alive as of 12.55 p.m. Central Standard Time, that is, as of 10 minutes ago. Mrs. Kennedy apparently was safe, and Mrs. Connolly also is safe. Both women were riding in the same car, the same limousine, in which the president and the governor were riding in their motorcade through Dallas when the assassination attempt took place. The um, governor, as we heard a moment ago, has been taken into the operating room. The president remains in the emergency ward of the hospital, and one Secret Service man was overheard telling another that there was no need to move the president because emergency facilities are entirely adequate in the emergency room. But as we have heard from correspondents... And now we take you to a KRLD Mobile News Unit and Bob Huffaker. This is Bob Huffaker. I am at Parkland Hospital along with Warren Forks for KRLD News. What was a wonderful welcome in downtown Dallas has become a scene of indescribable horror as hundreds of people crowd outside the back door to the emergency room here at Parkland Hospital. Faces are ashen white and people are wondering, is our president going to live? President Kennedy is on the inside of Parkland Hospital, and two priests have just been sent in to the room with the president. Speaking a moment ago to Congressman Jim Wright, Con Yarbrough a moment ago told KILD News he saw a Secret Service man beating the rear of the car on which the president was riding with his fist, and he knew something horrible had happened. Senator Yarbrough said he didn't know the extent of the injuries. No one knows those at present except those inside the hospital. And Senator Yarbrough said he believed them to be very grave. At present, reporters are being held outside the back door of Parkland Hospital, waiting some announcement, some word, on the condition of the president. Warren Fulks has further details. All we can add at this time was that about three and a half minutes ago, a spokesman from the hospital addressed himself to the press corps behind the hospital near the emergency exit saying he could not elaborate on the extent of the president's injuries nor the location of those injuries. But he did say the president is alive. The president is alive. Yarborough, who was riding, I believe, some two cars behind that of the president, was visibly shaken. He said the scene was too horrible to describe. However, we must bear in mind that he himself, being an eyewitness, was very visibly disturbed and as confused here as anyone else is. We repeat an announcement made just a short time ago. The president is alive. We are here at the scene, and we will remain here until further word is We'll keep it here for available. just a minute. This is KKK, this is KRLD News Unit at Parkland Hospital. Back now to Jay Hogan. We have standing by now uh, Wes Wise for another facet of this tragedy. So Wes, if you are ready, uh, take a short pause and go ahead.
apparently there was no reference made to whether the president or any of his party had been shot. Now, I'm going to check. We have someone uh, running back and forth to the uh, room. We're just around the corner from the main auditorium where the president was to appear with the first lady. We have somebody checking for us, and we understand that there still has been no announcement on the public address system of the fact that the president of the United States has been shot. Wes Wise for KRLD News, reporting direct from the trademark in Dallas. And now we return to CBS. The street from where President Kennedy and Governor Connolly were shot. Latest word from Dallas's Parkland Hospital is that uh, the condition of President Kennedy is being withheld at the moment. There are conflicting reports as to whether the injuries are serious or not serious. Two Roman Catholic priests have been admitted to the president's room. No word yet on the condition of Texas Governor John Connolly. This is Dan Rather in Dallas, Texas. To briefly summarize the situation, for those of you who may have just joined us in the last few minutes, President Kennedy was shot and wounded a short time ago in Dallas, Texas, and so was Texas Governor John Connolly. As their motorcade drove through downtown Dallas shortly after the presidential party arrived in that city, where the president was to have made a speech beginning just about now at the Dallas Trade Mart. The latest report in is that President Kennedy was given blood transfusions a short while ago as a result of the injuries he received in the assassination attempt. The president and Mrs. Kennedy were riding in the lead limousine, as were Governor and Mrs. Connolly. The two women were not hurt in the shooting. Both the president and the governor were shot. Both apparently were hit in the head. The initial reports say of the president... And now we interrupt CBS and go to Steve Perringer. Intersection of Field and Elm Street. Officers and Secret Service agents, uh, apparently Secret Service agents, have just taken a man who appears to be about 25 years of age into custody. He's been taken to the Dallas County Sheriff's op uh, Office. He was arrested across the street here where he stood in a large crowd. The man, as we said, about 25 years old, denied any knowledge of the shooting. He said that he had gone to the depository merely to use the telephone. Other radio reports filtering in here at this time indicate that officers also have another suspect north of this location that they are checking out. A flurry of activity here. The Dallas Fire Department currently on the scene. Shotgun armed officers completely around this school book depository building searching it out. As we told you earlier, Jerry Hill with the Dallas Police Department yelled from a fourth floor window that he had found some cartridges, spent cartridges, in a fourth floor room. So that's about the wrap up from here, Jay. Uh, this 25-year-old suspect has been taken to the Dallas County Sheriff's Office for further questioning. Steve Perrins reporting for KRLD News. And now we return you to CBS. I'm speaking at principal points around the state. The shooting occurred a short time after the presidential party arrived in Dallas. And as we have heard from correspondent Rather, apparently it took place from the fifth floor of the downtown office building where police and security agents have now found four spent cartridges, presumably those that were used in the assassination attempt. The building has been surrounded. We do not have any word on whether any people have been apprehended and linked directly with the shooting yet. The heavy street crowd, crowds between the Love Field Airport and the scene of the shooting, the crowds that had turned out to greet President Kennedy on his trip into Dallas, were overwhelmingly friendly. The shooting occurred about a half an hour ago and immediately created turmoil and confusion in the crowd and certainly in the presidential motorcade. The presidential reporting party, the party of reporters and correspondents, were driving in cars about five car lengths behind the president. As soon as the shooting took place and the president and the governor were injured, Secret Service men and Dallas Motorcycle Police immediately waved that car on by itself to the hospital. And in the resulting confusion and the crowds, the motorcade itself was strung out for some distance, and it took anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes before all of the White House party finally arrived at the hospital. Let's hear now more from the scene as we switch again to Dallas and CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint. Human blood type B plus has just been rushed into the operating room where President Kennedy and Governor Connolly are being worked over by doctors here at Parkland Memorial Hospital. We do not know whom the blood is for, but the situation still looks very bad. As we said a little earlier, two priests have also gone in to be with the president. 
here is an eyewitness report of approximately what happened at just about 12.30 noon as the motorcade with the president's car in front was going under a railroad overpass to enter a parkway. Three shots rang out very loudly. Immediately, the president's car sped up. The SS, the Secret Service men, pulled out machine guns and officers in the area began to fan out. The president's car sped directly to Parkland Memorial Hospital here at speeds up to 60 miles per hour. As the car pulled up, President Kennedy was bent over motionless with blood on his chest. Mrs. Kennedy was hovering over him, but he was lifted out of the car and reporters noted that he was wheeled into the hospital. That is the last that any reporters have seen of him as he disappeared on a stretcher motionless into the hospital. I repeat that the latest information we have only is that human blood has been rushed into the operating rooms. We do not know whether it is for the president or for Governor Connolly, both of whom are reported to be in serious condition. This is Robert Pierpoint at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. Here in New York, the New York Stock Exchanges have closed early for the day because of the shooting of President Kennedy. In Washington, the Senate recessed pending developments as word reached the Capitol there that the President had been shot in Dallas. The House was not in session at the time. Senator Mansfield, the Democratic leader, made the motion to recess at four minutes before two Eastern time. Senator Wayne Morris of Oregon said just before the recess, if there ever was an hour when all Americans should pray, this is the hour. Let's go back to Dallas. Here's another report by correspondent Dan Rather. The Dallas County Sheriff's Office reports it has arrested a 25-year-old suspect, a man suspected of possibly being connected with the shooting of President John Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly. Also from the scene of the area where the President and Texas Governor were shot, Shortly after noon, Central Standard Time today, the police continue their search around a five-story building in which four empty cartridges were found on the fifth floor. Another report from the scene of the shooting seems to confirm that one Secret Service agent was killed at the same time President Kennedy and Governor Connolly were shot. This is Dan Rather in Dallas, Texas. We are gathering details on a tragic story that has occurred in today's American history where the President of the United States and the Governor of the state of Texas have been shot and seriously wounded apparently in an assassination attempt in downtown Dallas. There is an unconfirmed report that Vice President Lyndon Johnson had been wounded slightly. One spectator said he saw Johnson walk into the hospital holding his arm and a short while ago, Mrs. Johnson was escorted by Secret Service agents into the emergency room where the president is. Police say they do not know whether the vice president was in that room at the time. But now we have this latest report, an unconfirmed one, that the vice president Johnson was wounded slightly. Let's switch now for news from the nation's capital as we switch to news correspondent Wells Church on Capitol Hill. Well, of course, Washington was probably hardest hit by this startling news. And oddly enough, by coincidence, the president's brother, Senator Ted Kennedy, was the presiding officer of the Senate when they learned of the shooting. Actually, he was calmly signing his name to a series of group photographs for visitors when an aide came running in with the word from Dallas. Well, most of the senators looked up, of course, obviously angry at the interruption, and the aide ran to Kennedy's chair, the senator threw down his pen, and the pictures scattered all over as he ran for the door. And the same aide ran from senator to senator telling them the news. They'd just been discussing the proposed extension of aid to rural libraries. Minority leader Dirksen put his hand to his heart. Senator Wayne Morse of Oregon, who's been leading, who had been leading the discussion, well, he walked a few steps and he stopped and he turned, and then he ran straight for a side door. Others in the chamber at the time included Senator Mansfield. And now we interrupt CBS to take you to Bob Huffaker in a KRLD mobile news unit. We're speaking once again from Dallas Parkland Hospital, where the scene is one of disbelief. The crowd is growing as spectators who have just learned of the horrible thing that has happened are sifting in from the street, walking in. People of all descriptions are standing here behind Parkland Hospital and waiting for some 
iota, some word about the condition of the president. Thus far, nothing but conjecture as to what has actually happened, where the president has been shot, and how badly he's been wounded. We spoke again with Senator Ralph Yarbrough, who burst into tears just a few moments ago. He, he reiterated what he told us earlier. He said the first he knew, after he heard the three short bursts, which he said sounded like a fusillade of shots, Senator Yarbrough said, I saw a Secret Service man sitting on the rear of the presidential car and pounding the car with his hands in despair, anguish, and pain. I knew something horrible had happened. Congressman Olin Teague and Congressman Ray Roberts. Congressman Roberts was perhaps the closest to the president besides those in the limousine with him. Congressman Roberts said, I simply couldn't say anything. I simply couldn't tell you anything. I just can't think straight. Not long after the president was taken inside the emergency room, a few moments ago, the first lady passed and brushed our arm. The Secret Service men recognized her. The policemen were so accustomed to stopping those who, who pushed in, attempting to try to find out the condition of the president, that they had to, they almost stopped the first lady as she came in. When she passed, not over three feet from me, she said nothing, but her eyes were full of tears, and she looked straight ahead. The first lady is in the emergency room with the president, and the crowd outside is quiet and waiting for some word of the condition of the president. This is Bob Huffaker at Parkland Hospital for KRLD. Many of the many of the senators came rushing here to the Senate radio gallery, uh, expecting to find later news here than they might even on that wire. Uh, Senator Curtis, for example, rushed in. Actually, uh, his face was flushed. He was chomping on a cigar. And, of course, we weren't able to tell them any more than you, uh, the audience, have already heard. CBS newsman David Schumacher was, uh, was in the gallery at the, uh, uh, at the time uh, that Senator Kennedy was told of the difficulty in Dallas. Uh, were there any other impressions you got? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you leave? we had to send him away. We're trying to have Dave. Uh... Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States is dead. John F. Kennedy has died of the wounds received in an assassination in Dallas less than an hour ago. We repeat, it has just been announced that President Kennedy is dead. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, is dead at the age of 46, shot by an assassin as he drove through the streets of Dallas, Texas, less than an hour ago. Repeating this, the President is dead, killed in Dallas, Texas, by a gunshot wound. repeat our announcement that the President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, is dead in Dallas, Texas, of an assassin's bullets. He was shot, and Governor Tom Connolly of the state of Texas was shot, as they rode in a motorcade through the streets of Dallas less than an hour ago. Governor Connolly is in serious condition. President John Kennedy is dead. 
the 35th president of the United States. He was 46 years old. According to the Constitution, Vice President Lyndon Johnson will now succeed Mr. Kennedy in office. And now we take you to Parkland Hospital and Bob Hoffaker. We're at Parkland Hospital where the horrible announcement has just come that our president is dead. No one wants to say anything on an occasion like this, but someone must have something to say. We have here with us Fort Worth Congressman Jim Wright. Mr. Wright, do you have something to say? We have just learned that our president is dead. This is a sad day, a day of grief, a day of shame for this land that anyone would hate, that anyone would seek to kill the president of the United States. We must strive anew to rebuild our faith and our hope May a merciful God console his loved ones and his family. May that same God bless this land that from this moment of such deep grief, we may rebuild in faith and not in fear and love and not in hate. I know the nation mourns and, and will deeply mourn. Those of us who were with him today when he was so alive so buoyant, so outgoing, exposing himself to the public, will never forget this experience and will always remember him as the president who went to the people, not fearing to expose himself, his person, his safety, his own repose to his land and his people. It is tragic that in this free land anyone would so learn to hate in his heart that he would seek to take violently into his hands this kind of an act. But it has been done. There is still in this land the fiber to rebuild on a basis of respect for duly constituted authority, and we must do it. We must not panic. God bless you, Congressman Wright. Still here at Parkland Hospital, even though the announcement has been made to newsmen, some people are still unaware what has happened. And momentarily, people will rush up to us when Congressman Wright began to cry a short while ago People began to rush over to our mobile news unit and say, what has happened? What has happened? How is the president? We had to say what had happened. People are standing outside this emergency entrance to Parkland Hospital and weeping bitterly. Senator Ralph Yarbrough, Congressman Ray Roberts, we can see Congressman Olin Teague of the 6th District all are crying. None can express what they feel. The only question that remains in most of their minds, all they can say now, is how is John? They mean, of course, Governor John Connolly. The latest word on the condition of Governor Connolly although no firm report has yet been made. The word is that Governor Connolly was shot in the right upper chest. This is only rumor at this time and has not yet been confirmed. Still, the crowd awaits further news. The crowd waits with disbelief in their eyes. People are crying all around us newsmen who see death every day are crying. Congressmen, senators who love the president. A scene
theme of indescribable sadness and horror at the emergency entrance of Dallas Parkland Hospital. This is Bob Huffaker for KILD News. And now we return you to CBS. He was reported badly shocked by the shooting. Doctors are trying to keep him as quiet as possible. He is under heavy Secret Service and police protection. Throughout the Texas trip, when President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson had been in the same motorcade, as an obvious security measure, they have ridden in separate cars. The Johnson car has always been some distance from the Kennedy car, sometimes by as much as 60 yards. We see the reason and the value of this at this point. And now we take you to the KRLD newsroom and Jay Hogan. The trade mart where the uh, luncheon function was awaited uh, before the shooting this afternoon. We take you now to Westwise at the trade mart. A few people are queuing into groups as the dining room has begun to empty. Along the walls, several women are crying, near hysteria apparently, but by and large the crowd has taken the news quite well. Only now are they beginning to learn the official word that our president is dead. Up until a few moments ago, they were not sure exactly what had happened. Then an announcement was made by Mr. Eric Johnson. He said approximately the following. I don't know how I can say it, or whether I can. The president and the governor have been shot. Then there were moans from the audience. I have nothing but scant reports. As soon as I have anything definite, I'll tell you. Dr. Luther Holcomb, who was driving four cars back from the president's automobile, is the executive secretary of the Greater Dallas uh, uh, Council of Churches. He said a prayer here, which many people remarked on, at the trademark who were still on hand. We have Dr. Holcomb here with us. Dr. Holcomb, if you will, please first recreate as closely as you can what you said in prayer to the crowd there in the trademark. Wes, well, I uh, believe that most of the radio audience would be very much like those present at the trademark. And with your permission, I believe I would just like to lead all of us in prayer. Oh God, this is a time of mourning for Dallas. We are stunned. We are speechless. We do not know how to phrase our prayer. But we come with the cry from our hearts to hear our prayer. We need thy strength. We do pray for the family of the President of the United States, for people around the world who have looked to our country and look to him for leadership. We do remember our governor and members of his family. Now, O oh God, help us to be calm. Grant to us the peace that passeth all understanding. Amen. That was Dr. Luther Holcomb, who said this prayer approximately at the trademark earlier this afternoon. Further words from here with the superfluous. Wes Wise reporting from the trademark in Dallas. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we have been doing uh, all afternoon, we will switch you to CBS Radio. The first report that we've had on one of the wire services that the president has died. This means, of course, that Vice President Lyndon Johnson has become the president automatically under American law. The president and his party had just arrived in Dallas just about an hour ago. The president was on a three-day trip to Texas, part of it for politics. This was the second day of the trip, and he had flown into Dallas and was due to be speaking at this moment at the Dallas Trade Mart, where he had an important speech which had been released a short time before by the White House and which in fact had been quoted and in fact published in afternoon newspapers and quoted on afternoon broadcast. The president who went to Dallas to deliver that speech did not deliver the speech and he is dead instead. 
killed by an assassin, and we have had one report that Dallas police have picked up a 24-year-old suspect as the possible killer. Now, that report came from Dan Rather in Dallas. Uh, the uh, suspect is, well, actually was identified as being 25 years old, and we haven't heard anything more on that for about 15 minutes. Uh, the original report was that police had surrounded a uh, five-floor office building in downtown Dallas, and that they had found four empty cartridges on the fifth floor of that building. Uh, it seems uh, almost certain that the assassin must have used a uh, rifle with a telescopic sight in order to uh, zero in so accurately on the president and Governor Connolly. Uh, but we don't know who he is. We, uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, further report on who the suspect is or even the reason. And, of course, uh, speculation on his reasons for killing the president and trying to kill Governor Connolly would be idle at this point. Uh, we did have one other report that a Secret Service agent had been killed. We don't have the name of the agent so far. Uh, we understand now that a casket uh, for the president's body is being brought into Parkland Hospital in Dallas. It all happened very quickly. It all happened uh, inside an hour. The president and, the, and Governor Connolly riding together with their wives uh, through downtown Dallas uh, on their way to the Dallas Trade Fair, about four shots rang out. Witnesses, eyewitnesses mentioned hearing two or three shots. The president slumped forward with blood on his head, blood on his chest. The governor also uh, slumped forward. Uh, the governor uh, is not reported seriously injured. Bill Stinson, an assistant to Governor Connolly, says he talked to the governor in the hospital operating room and Connolly was shot just below the shoulder blade in the back. And now we're going to switch again to Dallas, this time to Nelson Benton. I'm sorry, we thought we had Nelson Benton on the line, but uh, the communication seemed to have failed at the last moment. Uh, here's a, a late report. Senator Ralph Yarborough of Texas, uh, who accompanied the president to to Texas only yesterday on the presidential plane, was talking with newsmen a few minutes ago and uh, collapsed in sobs as he told of witnessing the slaying of the president. And now we're going to switch to George Herman at the White House in Washington. Perhaps a thousand times the man named Lyndon Baines Johnson, up to now Vice President of the United States, has told friends how his father used to wake him up every morning by whacking him across the soles of the feet and saying, wake up, Lyndon, you're an hour late and a dollar short of every boy in town. Now Lyndon Johnson is 55 years old, and he's still inclined to worry whether he's still an hour late and a dollar behind every other boy in politics. Johnson is a big man, but without the easy self-confidence that many big men have. He's a warrior, constantly worrying about his position. Is he doing right? Is he still in the right position, strategically, tactically, politically? It's a symptom of this uncertainty that all the time he was running the United States Senate, a Senate majority leader with an efficient and iron hand, he kept in his three big offices, three big full-length paintings of himself, mostly opposite his desk where he could glance up any time and see himself slightly larger than life. Johnson is a conscientious man. He ran the Senate with rigid control, but let everybody have his say. Let everybody argue for his point of view on the floor of the Senate, and seldom, if ever, shut off debate or parliamentary maneuverings without consulting all hands. He ran things in the Senate, but he ran them without riding roughshod over the opposition, except in the usual way, rounding up the votes and beating them decisively in the vote. Lyndon Johnson has often been accused by liberals of being the Southern conservative in President Kennedy's official family. But he came to Washington as a strong New Dealer, so strong a supporter of Franklin D. Roosevelt that the president brought him here in his official yacht, and Johnson and Roosevelt consulted constantly on ways and means of getting Roosevelt's legislation through the Congress. Only more recently has he come to be considered as a conservative, mostly by those liberals who wanted a stronger civil rights bill passed than Johnson thought could pass the Senate. Johnson is the kind of man who sees no sense whatsoever in fighting for a bill when you cannot muster the votes for it. He thinks it's just plain idiocy to make a stand for the record, to make an issue, when you don't have actually the votes that can be counted to put the bill through. And so, for this reason, he has very often been considered as a conservative, more conservative than he actually is. Also, for political reasons, he has sometimes taken a more conservative stand simply by keeping quiet on liberal matters. 
Lyndon Baines Johnson, 55 years old. He's had one heart attack several years ago. It was discovered by his friend, Senator Clinton Anderson. He took care of himself and was able to actively campaign for the vice presidency in the last election. Actively, energetically, perspiring profusely through the heat, but fighting all the way for his man, John Kennedy, to become the president of the United States. Lyndon Baines Johnson, 55 years old, now the next in line, the next in the spotlight. This is George Herman in Washington, returning you now for the latest to Dallas Townsend in New York. Well, the latest we have here, George, simply is that the president is dead. He died 41 minutes ago at 2 p.m. New York time, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas, Texas. Just a few minutes, about half an hour after he had been shot, mortally wounded, by an assassin who must have used a rifle with a telescopic sight, to attack both him and Governor Connolly. Eyewitnesses say that three, possibly four shots rang out. The president slumped forward uh, in his limousine. The car was rushed to Parkland Hospital, but it was too late. Uh, the latest we have from the Associated Press is that Mr. Kennedy lived about an hour. I think it was a bit less than that. Lived about an hour after a sniper cut him down as his limousine left downtown Dallas. And the mantle of the presidency has now automatically fallen on the vice president. Police in Dallas have found a foreign-made rifle. Sheriff's officers are questioning a young man picked up at the scene. This must be the 25-year-old suspect mentioned a few moments ago by correspondent Dan Rather, who is in Dallas. The name of the man has not been made public, nor has the name of the Secret Service officer who apparently was shot and killed at the same time that the fatal attack was made on President Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson, although he has not yet taken the oath of office, is now, at the age of 55 years old, the 37th President of the United States. Dallas, I think we might uh, emphasize here that the Vice President was not injured in the shooting today. There had been one report earlier that he might have been injured slightly, that he had entered the hospital holding his arm. Vice President Johnson's wife, after a quick check on conditions in the hospital, said that her hu husband was unharmed. He was not shot. And again, we note that uh, throughout this Texas trip, when the President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson had been in the same motorcade, as an obvious security measure, they have ridden in separate cars. The Johnson car has always been some distance from the Kennedy car, sometimes by as much as 60 yards. Incidentally, uh, to remind our listeners and our stations along the network, the CBS radio network will program continuously on the story of the death of President John Kennedy and subsequent developments until further notice. We are continuing to get details and more information from Dallas, the scene of the shooting, and reaction is beginning to pour in from all parts of the world. We've already had a cable from some of our overseas correspondents, Dan Shore, cables from Bonn, that the new Chancellor of West Germany, Earhart, who had been scheduled to fly to Washington Sunday to confer with the President, is automatically canceling his visit, even though he had not at the time received official notification of the President's death. Alan, one of the many ironies in this situation is that the uh, assassination of President Kennedy occurred at a time when there were rumors, and, by, and former Vice President Nixon mentioned them, that the President might decide not to have Vice President Johnson run with him on the ticket in 1964. And now we're getting more information from the scene of the area, and for that we're going to switch to the radio network pool at the Dallas Trade Mart. Not all of those guests, 2,500 of them, who were assembled here to hear the President of the United States make a speech, have yet left. Many of them are still loitering near the speaker's stand. Some of them are still crying at the news that the President has been assassinated. Immediately after the news went across the crowd of some 2,500 like wildfire, tears broke out on many faces of both sexes and of both colors who were present here. A Negro porter leaned his head back against the rostrum which bore the seal of the President of the United States, pulled out his handkerchief, and wept. An announcement was made to the crowd that the President had been shot, that there would be no luncheon, and most of the crowd at that time left. There was no panic here at the trademark, but there were many tears, and there was a sullen silence for some minute or so after the first news of the assassination of the President. It has now been confirmed at Parkland Hospital in Dallas that the President of the United States is dead. He was shot in the head by a high-powered rifle, apparently, from a window in a building on the 
western end of downtown Dallas. This occurred during a motorcade which was to bring the president here to the trademark for a speech to 2,500 persons. The president was immediately rushed to Parkland Hospital. Governor John Connolly was also taken to Parkland Hospital with gunshot wounds in the back. He is at this time reported in satisfactory condition. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was not injured. He was riding in a separate car. Dallas police are believed to have surrounded the person who is suspected of having made the assassination. However, no arrests have been reported at this time. And the dragnet is out in at least two sections of the city, one of them where the incident occurred and the other in the southwestern part of Dallas in Oak Cliff. The news is now official at Parkland Hospital. President John F. Kennedy is dead, having been assassinated by an unknown person who was shooting a high-powered rifle from a window of a downtown Dallas building during a motorcade. Here at the trademark, at first, most of the 2,500 guests who were gathered to hear the president were not aware of what had happened. The press delegation of some two or 300 members of the press from all over the country first rushed to the front of the building when the bulletin was first made known privately and in the corridors, and then rushed back, got their notepads, cameras, and left the building in a hurry. Most of them have gone to Parkland Hospital, where the president has just been reported to have died at about 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. After that, most of the guests in the building still did not know of the incident, and it was nearly half an hour before an announcement was made from the rostrum that an incident had occurred. Then another announcement that the president had been shot. This was followed by two benedictions delivered by ministers here in Dallas. Dr. Luther Holcomb of the Council of Churches delivered one of them and made most of the announcements. Then the people left, and the noises you hear now are of the porters and waiters picking up what is left of a luncheon that never occurred in honor of the President of the United States. It is not known just when Lyndon Johnson, the Vice President, will be sworn in as the new President of the United States. It is possible that that swearing-in may occur here in Dallas. Reports reaching Dallas from New York are that the New York Stock Exchange has closed because the traffic became too heavy upon the news that the President had been shot. No and now we go to a KRLD news mobile unit and Bob Huffaker. We're speaking once again from Parkland Hospital and have just come from the temporary press room which has been set up here in the south side of the building. Briefing the press in this most distasteful press session was administrative aide to Governor Connolly, Bill Stenson. This is the first report and the latest on Governor Connolly's condition. He has been shot in the right chest and his body is completely perforated. He has also sustained a fracture of the right radius, and Secret Service men say this may be from another bullet, or it may be from simply a wound in the, in the struggle. Bill Stenson, the administrative aide who was carrying on the briefing session of the press, said that when the governor was first brought into the emergency room, he quickly asked the governor, how bad are you? The governor said, he thought he had been hit from the back. Stenson, the only official word thus far on the condition of Governor Connolly, has described his condition as very serious, but there is great hope. He goes on to say that the governor's pulse is normal, his blood is good, and he says, quoting the doctors, that vital signs which are known to indicate conditions are good. He says the governor's color is good. Governor Connolly is at present undergoing surgery. He has already undergone numerous x-rays which are now being developed. His condition, again, we will repeat, is described as very serious, but Bill Stenson, the administrative aide who made the announcement, said, but there is very great hope. Another aide to the governor, Julian Reed, said that uh, diagramming the places occupied by the president. The president and Mrs. Kennedy and the governor and Mrs. Connolly were all four riding in the same automobile. Both Mrs. Connolly and Mrs. Kennedy are uninjured. Both are all right. Governor Connolly, we will repeat, suffered a wound in the upper right chest. His condition is said to be very serious, but with very great hope. 
Malcolm Kildoff, the acting press secretary on this particular tour for Dallas, has been briefing the press uh, as the situation progresses on what is happening, just as he has briefed the press on many occasions throughout his career. Just a few moments ago, as we walked from the press room, and most of the press has now spoken and left the press room, Malcolm Kildoff, the acting press secretary, said, this is one briefing I never thought I'd give. There's no further word at this time than that we have given you. And the atmosphere here at Parkland Hospital is, we repeat, one of extreme horror and disbelief. This is Bob Huffaker now reporting for KRLD News and returning you to the studio. We've had no late word yet on when Vice President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, will take the oath of office, but we assume that it will be as rapidly as possible. Uh, I remember that when President Roosevelt died in 1945, Vice President Truman took the oath of office about two hours afterward in the old cabinet room of the White House. But regardless of when he takes the oath of office, Lyndon Johnson is now the 36th President of the United States. Dallas, I would like to pass along a memo to our listeners and our stations along the network again, and that is a reminder that the CBS radio network will program continuously on the story of the death of President John F. Kennedy and subsequent developments until further notice. We will be back with more details in just a moment. We will take five-second pause now for station identification. This is KRLD AM and FM in Dallas. This is Alan Jackson at CBS News headquarters in New York, where we are bringing you the details of the assassination the day of the President of the United States, John Kennedy. President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, killed by a bullet in the head while riding in an open car through the streets of Dallas. His wife was in the same car, but was not hit. She cradled the president in her arms as he was carried to a hospital where he died. Vice President Lyndon Johnson was in the same motorcade and was immediately surrounded by Secret Service men until he could take the oath of office as president. We have no word on when that will be, but it will be shortly, later this afternoon. Governor John Connolly of Texas, sitting beside the president in the automobile, was also hit by the assassin's bullet. He was wounded in the back, but we are told it is not critical. Johnson was in the Parkland Hospital when President Kennedy died. The vice president was in the same motorcade as it sped through crowds in the downtown streets, but he was some distance back and was not harmed. And as we have noted earlier, this was a deliberate separation between the president and the vice president for security reasons, and the precaution paid off today. Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Connolly were both in the same famous bubble-top limousine with their husbands. Today, the limousine's protective glass shield was down. Neither woman was hurt in the assassination. Mrs. Kennedy screamed as her husband fell over on the back seat. She held his head in her arms. The car was splattered with blood. The last rites of the Roman Catholic Church were administered to the 46-year-old president at Parkland Hospital. The identity of the assassin, or assassins, has not been immediately announced, but sheriff officers have taken a young man of 25 into custody and are questioning him behind closed doors. One Dallas television reporter said he saw a rifle being withdrawn from a window on the fifth or sixth floor of an office building shortly after the gunfire. The president was shot at 1.25 Eastern time, according to this report, and he died approximately 35 minutes later at 2 o'clock, just one hour ago. As always, the president was surrounded by Secret Service men and had an escort of Dallas motorcycle police. But, as we have said, the protective bubble top of the car was down today, and so sudden and treacherous was the attack that Kennedy and Connolly were cut down before his guards could stop the attack. A man named Charles Bream of Dallas was standing in the big crowd at curbside about 15 feet away as the president's car approached, and Bream said he was waving, and the first shot hit him, and that awful look crossed his face. Exactly two weeks ago today, President Kennedy had observed the third anniversary of his election victory over Richard Nixon in the 1960 elections. The president was conscious as he arrived at the hospital. Father Huber from Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church was called in and administered the last rites of the church. 
The president died just an hour ago. He had spoken only this morning at a breakfast given by the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce. Gov Governor Connolly underwent an operation for uh, the gunshot wound he received about a half an hour ago. Connolly's condition is said to be serious, but his doctors say the vital signs are good. The Connolly has a good pulse, and his respiration is satisfactory, and his recovery at the moment is expected. Governor Connolly was wounded in the same assassination attempt in which President Kennedy was killed. Now, Alan, Alan uh, it's tragic to think of the uh, sadness and the sorrow that has come to this family, which has shown so much energy and initiative in the last two generations. The president's oldest brother, Lieutenant Joseph P. Kennedy, Jr., was killed in action in Europe in 1944 while making a, while in the progress of a hazardous mission over German-occupied Europe. A month later, the husband of one of his sisters, Kathleen, died in action in France. He was the Marcus of Hartington, who was a captain in the Coldstream Guards. And Lady Hartington herself met tragic death in the spring of 1948, along with three others, in the crash of a plane in France. And the president's youngest son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, who was born prematurely during the summer in Massachusetts, lived only two days and then died of, of uh, infant diseases. Now the, the fourth and by far the greatest tragedy to strike the Kennedy family has come in the assassination of the President of the United States. And now we take you to Bob Huffaker. We're speaking once again from Dallas Parkland Hospital. The rear door of Dallas Parkland Hospital is the emergency room door. For a number of hours this afternoon, the door has been ringed with his men and anxious spectators. Citizens of the United States who were anxious to see what the condition was of our president and of the governor of the state of Texas. Not too long ago, when the announcement was made that John F. Kennedy had died of the assassin's bullet, people stood for several more minutes in disbelief. Many are still standing now at a greater distance from the hospital, having been moved back by Secret Service agents and Dallas police. But some are now beginning to wander away, wandering away with ashen faces in disbelief, in pain, and in grief. Still, a ring of people still stands now backed up to a distance of about 100 yards from the rear door of the, of the hospital. And many police are still patrolling the area. People have been uh, moved back. Just why, we don't know at this time. Nobody knows why people have been moved to a greater distance. The latest word to come from our last press conference session inside the temporary press headquarters in the southern side of Parkland is that Governor Connolly's condition is very serious, and yet very serious with a note of great hope. His pulse, blood, color, these are said to be good. There are still a number of congressmen seated in cars and in some of the buses that were brought immediately to the hospital. None are saying very much at all. Few can find the words to describe what they feel at this time. Most of them say, there's nothing. There's nothing to be said. There's a flurry of movement now. 
and from the rear of the hospital comes first the lead police car and two following motorcycles. Here comes a white hearse which is leaving the hospital followed by cars full of secret service men and one last motorcycle. From our vantage point here, we do not know if this was the body of the president. We can only wonder. And now that the hearse is passed, the crowd is breaking up. And people are wandering away. Still wondering, still disbelieving, still shocked. There are people weeping. There are people in dead silence. But this is one of the quietest crowds that will ever assemble. A crowd with pity, sorrow, horror, and shame in its heart. For this was the day that the President of the United States died from an assassin's bullet in Dallas, Texas. There's nothing left to be said. This is Bob Husker reporting from Parkland Hospital for KRLD News. And now here's Jay Hogan from the KRLD Newsroom. In the public interest, this broadcast requested by the telephone company, uh, represented by uh, uh, spokesman and official Mr. Will Rogers, appealing to the public, appealing to the concerned public, but not to telephone Parkland Hospital. Please do not telephone Parkland Hospital. All the trunk lines are jammed, and it's interfering with necessary communications with Parkland Hospital. Public of Dallas, please do not call Parkland Hospital, except in case of extreme emergency. This request, broadcast by KRLD from the telephone company. Assassination. Lodge is in San Francisco. He said, I was very fond of him and knew him intimately. We served in Congress together, knew each other before that in Massachusetts. Lately, he said, we have been particularly close because he followed, not followed, but guided America's foreign policy. He took a keen personal interest in it and gave it a great deal of personal time. Lodge had paused in San Francisco on his way from a high-level policy conference on South Vietnam in Honolulu, he had planned to meet with Mr. Kennedy Sunday morning, but he says now that he will leave tomorrow morning for Washington and report to April Harriman, the Assistant Secretary of State. We should remind our listeners and our stations along the network that we will continue with the present programming on the CBS radio network and all regularly scheduled programs and commercial announcements will be discontinued until further notice. Alan, we now have the name of that suspect who has been picked up by Dallas, Texas police in connection with the slaying of a Dallas policeman. This story says the Dallas Police Department has arrested a 24-year-old man identified as Lee H. Oswald in connection with the slaying of a Dallas policeman shortly after President Kennedy was assassinated. Oswald is also being interrogated to see if he had any connection with the slaying of the president. Oswald was pulled screaming and yelling, according to this story, from the Texas theater in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. This story uh, does not say that Oswald is the man wanted in connection with the uh, slaying of the president. It says that he is wanted in connection with the killing of a Dallas policeman. Uh, this, this policeman may be the Secret Service agent who was referred to earlier as being the man uh, shot and killed at the same time that the president was assassinated. Some more human interest reaction has come in to the death of the president. A taxi driver in New York City, 60-year-old Joseph Kaufman, 
when he heard the news, put his hand to his head and moaned simply, those dirty bums. And then he told his passenger, as soon as I drop you off, I'm going home. I can't work anymore. Alabama's Governor George Wallace said that whoever fired the shots must be filled with universal malice toward all. It is hard to believe that anyone would shoot at the President of the United States. A further word from Dallas is that Vice President Johnson, now President Johnson, is returning immediately to Washington and will be in Washington by evening where he is expected to be sworn into office. As my colleague Dallas Townsend has pointed out, that even before he is actually sworn in, he is the President of the United States. A tremendous traffic jam developed around Parkland Hospital in Dallas. White House officials stood by sorrowfully looking stunned in corridors in a waiting room. For an agonizing minute after minute, there were conflicting rumors as to whether the president was still alive. And then came the official announcement that John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 35th president of the United States, was dead. Alan, something more on that arrest that's been made in Dallas, Texas. The man named Lee H. Oswald, that's the identification given him by the Dallas Police Department, brandished a, pol a pistol which officers took away from him after a scuffle. Police officer M. N. McDonald who was cut across the face in the scuffle, quotes Oswald as saying after he was subdued, well, it's all over now. A large crowd gathered around the theater, the Texas Theater in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, and witnessed the arrest. Police had to, crawl, had to hold the crowds back because many apparently connected the arrested man with the assassination of the president. And as we said a moment ago, there is no such connection at the moment as far as is known publicly. The officer who was killed, J.D. Tippett, was killed by a man answering the description of Oswald in the neighborhood a short time before. Tippett had been slain with a pistol. The president was assassinated with a high-powered rifle with a telescopic sight, and uh, it may well be that, that two men are involved here, especially since we had a report a few minutes ago that an arrest had been made in Fort Worth. And now, here's Frank Glaber. We've just received uh, word from school superintendent Dr. W.T. White. Uh, principals of all schools in the Dallas area uh, have been ordered to lower the flag to half-mast until further notice. Uh, the uh, school superintendent also asked us to pass along the word that school will be out at the regular uh, time today uh, because of transportation problems and what have you. And uh, probably uh, most important of all here that the uh, football game, the, a big football game scheduled in the Dallas uh, area tonight between Woodrow Wilson and South Oak Cliff has been called off. The football game between Woodrow Wilson and South Oak Cliff has been uh, postponed until uh, further notice because uh, in relation to the uh, events which occurred here in Dallas today. And now we return to CBS Radio. His widely publicized adventures as the skipper of PT-109 in the Pacific during World War II had left a lifetime mark on the president. He was inclined to minimize any physical danger from assassins' bullets. This reporter, who covered John Kennedy throughout the year of 1960, through seven primaries, the convention, and the victorious campaign, vividly recalls one night in June of that year, high in the skies over the Great Plains, and the Kennedy family plane, the Caroline. The primaries were over. The senator from Massachusetts had swept the board. He was relaxed and confident as he looked forward to the Los Angeles convention and the campaign ahead. For the first time, he serious, seriously believed he had an excellent chance of not only winning the Democratic nomination, but of moving on to the presidency. He knew that I had covered the White House during six years of General Eisenhower's administration, and he was curious on this summer night, high in the skies, over the heartlands of the nation, as to just what the White House would be like. The conversation turned to the Secret Service. I explained that if he became president, he would no longer be able to move about freely as he had as a senator. It was apparent that Senator Kennedy wasn't buying this line of thought, even though the Secret Service has the authority to order the president to follow their instructions if they believed his life might be in potential danger. Mr. Kennedy shook his head in disbelief when told the Secret Service made arrangements for former President Truman's personal necessities when traveling and thought the agents running alongside President Eisenhower's automobile and motorcades only served to block the public's vision of the chief executive. He observed on that night, I recall the substance, if not the exact quote, so well, that there wasn't any sure-proof way to protect the president from a dedicated, able assassin. In his three years in office, President Kennedy did change some traditional Secret Service responsibilities. For one thing, he liked to drive a car himself, frequently took the wheel from the hands of the SS driver. He also liked to change schedules on the spur of the moment 
and on occasion was unprotected until agents realized he had left their midst. It is tragically ironic that when the assassin's bullet came, it came at a moment when the president was under full Secret Service protection. But as he had said in the Caroline three years ago, if a composed madman with high grades and marksmanship wants to kill the leader of the nation, there is little the Secret Service can do about it. This is Charles Von Fremd at the Justice Department. We have received word here at our CBS News headquarters in New York that officers at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland say they understand that President Kennedy's body will be brought back to Washington this afternoon. Senator Ted Kennedy, the youngest of the Kennedy brothers, is said to be flying to Cape Cod to be with the Kennedy family. That is, with the late president's father and mother. There's more reaction now here in the New York area. Let's switch now to our CBS News correspondent, Bernard Eisman, who is reporting from New York's St. Patrick's Cathedral. The bells tolled on Fifth Avenue, and the traffic noise became almost non-existent. Something unusual for a day at this time in New York. And as the news of the president's death spread through the city, people of all faiths came to the Roman Catholic St. Patrick's Cathedral. They're streaming in now and coming out tears in their eyes, their cheeks wet from crying. One woman told me, I'm Jewish, but when I heard, I had to go to a Catholic church to pray for President Kennedy. Other people going in and out remarked only on the tragedy. They all seem to be stunned. Come, and as Fifth Avenue becomes clogged with traffic heading for the cathedral, the bells continue to toll, and they toll the grief that is being felt by most New Yorkers. This is Bernard Eisman at St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue in New York. We've had yet another report on the possible time of Lyndon Johnson's official swearing in as the new president. This one is that he is expected to be sworn in as president aboard an airliner before flying immediately back to the nation's capital. A moment ago, we had a report that he would be flying back to Washington to be sworn in there. It is all uh, a matter of speculation at the moment and really academic because Lyndon Johnson became president of the United States according to the terms of the Constitution immediately upon the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who died just under two hours ago in Dallas from the bullets of an assassin. And now we take you to the KRLD newsroom and Jay Hogan. Just this moment we have received a report uh, and will receive uh, further details on it uh, from San Antonio. For that report now, we take you to uh, John Woody at radio station KBAT in San Antonio. We just talked with a Mr. George Christian of the administrative office of the press secretary at Governor Connolly's office in Austin, and he issued this report. He is uh, still in the operating room. Uh, they have opened his chest. Uh, he's got a number of broken ribs uh, and a bruised lung caused by the blast. His uh, lung was collapsed, but it has now been reinflated. And there's no serious artery damage to his heart. Uh, his pulse and blood pressure are still all right. That's the latest I have on him. That was Mr. George Christian, the administrative assistant to the press secretary and Governor John Connolly's office in Austin. This is John Woody, KBAT Radio, San Antonio. This is KRLD News. Now back to CBS. In his suite at 122 Bowdoin Street in Boston, uh, right near the Massachusetts State Capitol. That's uh, a an apartment which the Kennedy family still retains and which the president always used for his legal voting address. At that time, the president was considered quite likely to announce for the Democratic presidential nomination, but he hadn't actually done it, and a lot of people felt he had very little chance of getting it. But I remember being struck at the time by feeling that he was at least going to put into the attempt everything that he possibly had, and as it turned out, he did get it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're getting still more reports and more reactions, and uh, we've had another one of our correspondents in the Washington staff check in with us. So let's hear now from Paul Niven at Robert Kennedy's home in Washington. At the time of the president's assassination, Attorney General Robert Kennedy was lunching at his home here with Robert Morgenthau, last year's unsuccessful Democratic gubernatorial candidate in New York State. The Attorney General learned of his brother's assassination in a phone call from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Within a few moments, a Roman Catholic priest appeared here at the house to give the family condolences. 
Another visitor was Central Intelligence Agency Director John McCall. He and Robert Kennedy walked for some minutes in the garden. Mrs. Ethel Kennedy, the Attorney General's wife, left the house briefly to gather some of her children from their private schools. When the party returned, the Attorney General welcomed them at the door and gathered one of his young daughters into his arms. This is Paul Niven at McLean, Virginia. And now for some uh, special local announcements. Here is Bill Mercer. Thank you, Jay. First, we ask that you do not call Parkland Hospital. The telephone company and the police have, and Parkland Hospital has been deluged with calls. We uh, urge you, I know you're interested in the condition of the governor of the state of Texas, John Connolly, but the hospital cannot handle the calls, and if you will not call there, listen to your radio and TV stations. We'll bring you the latest reports on the condition of the governor. The potentate E.D. Malone has called off the annual appreciation dinner of the Hella Temple Shrine that was to have been held tonight at the Holiday Inn. The Woodrow Wilson South Oak Cliff football game, the high school game scheduled tonight at Cobb Stadium, has been postponed until 7.30 tomorrow night. That's the Woodrow Wilson South Oak Cliff game postponed until 7.30 tomorrow evening. This is KRLD News, and as we join CBS again, uh, here is a report by a CBS man, Robert Pierpoint, coming from this point, Dallas, Texas. President's right, Mrs. Kennedy, the bereaved widow, stood on the president's left as the ceremony was held. The oath was administered by a federal district judge from northern Texas, a woman, 67-year-old Sarah Hughes, who was appointed a federal judge by the late President Kennedy in 1961. As the judge administered the oath of office to the new president, she was crying, and Mrs. Kennedy, of course, had tears in her eyes. A number of those in the crowded forward cabin of the jet plane also were red-eyed with weeping over the death of President Kennedy. The ceremony concluded. President Johnson turned, embraced Mrs. Kennedy, and then said, let's get this plane off to Washington. I repeat... A new president of the United States has been sworn in here at Love Field outside Dallas. He is now on his way to Washington. This is Robert Pierpoint reporting. KRLD AM and FM Dallas. News headquarters in New York. My colleague Dallas Townsend has some background information and further sidelights on the life and the history and career of the new president of the United States. Dallas. Alan, on the day that Lyndon Bain Johnson was born... His grandfather is said to have looked at him and said he'll be a United States senator someday. That prophecy was borne out. Twenty-nine years after it was made, the grandson was elected to Congress. In 1948, when he was 40 years old, he was elected to the Senate. He won his first seat in the Senate by the almost invisible margin of 87 votes. But that fact didn't dampen his sense of humor. He began a speech a short time later by saying... Well, here I am, landslide Lyndon. Within four years after that, his Democratic colleagues chose him as the Senate Majority Leader, an honor which he retained throughout the rest of his career in the United States Senate. In 1960, Lyndon Johnson was elected Vice President of the United States, an office which carried with it the duty of presiding over the Senate in which he had served for 12 years. At the same time, he was a candidate for re-election to his Senate seat, and he also won that, but naturally he couldn't hold both offices, and he resigned from the Senate. At the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles in 1960, Mr. Johnson was a serious contender for the presidential nomination. He was strongly supported by Southern delegates, but he lost out to the junior senator from Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy received 806 votes on the first ballot. Lyndon Johnson received 409. The number required for a nomination was 761. Some of us who were on the outskirts of Los Angeles that night remember standing outside the small apartment house where Senator Kennedy was uh, incommunicado waiting for the result of the vote. The apartment house was owned, as I recall, by Bill Gargan, the uh, retired movie actor uh, who has always been a good friend of President Kennedy. And when he came out, there was an enormous crush tremendous crush on the uh, street of that rather 
quiet suburb of Los Angeles. Then Mr. Kennedy drove into Los Angeles to accept the nomination in person. Mr. Kennedy then chose Senator Johnson for second place on the ticket. He said that Lyndon Johnson has demonstrated on many occasions his brilliant qualifications for the leadership we require today. The ticket was intended to reinforce a noticeably weak spot on Kennedy's southern flank, noticeably, notably Texas, and to provide a balance. Kennedy was a liberal Yankee. He came from Massachusetts, while Johnson was a southerner, somewhat more conservative, and came from Texas. But uh, he has proved since then that he is not conservative in the sense that it's usually, the word is usually known. Uh, he has been just as liberal in his thinking as the president. In any case, it proved to be a winning combination. Johnson's Texas, which had gone for General Eisenhower in 1952 and 1956, returned to the Democratic fold, but only narrowly by 43,000 votes. And it's doubly ironic that one of the reasons for Mr. Kennedy's trip to Texas, the fatal trip, was to shore up the Democratic Party strength in Texas and reinforce his chances for winning the state next year. Mr. Kennedy captured all but three states of the traditionally Protestant South, where his Catholic faith had been a live issue in the campaign. This is KRLD, AM and FM, Dallas. Now to the KRLD newsroom and Jay Hogan. Two eyewitnesses to the fatal shooting of President Kennedy today were perhaps closest to the scene of all. They are two Dallas women who picked out a special vantage point near the triple underpass. One took a close-up picture of the president almost at the moment he was struck by the fatal bullets. KRLD News talked with both in an interview a few minutes ago by telephone. Hello, Miss right. Hill. Yes. D did you say you were at the site of the assassination? Yes, sir, we were. My son took the picture as he was hit. Your son took the picture, and you were there, my, too? My son took the picture as he was hit. I see. You were both there at the scene? That's right. right. Uh, uh, who was your friend? Mary Mormon. Uh, is she there now? Yes, she is. Uh, may I speak with her? Yes. She, she, after she took the picture, she fell on the ground. Uh-huh. And she didn't know he was shot. Yes. Just um, a moment. Mary? Yes. Hello, Miss Mormon. Yes. Uh, you took the picture uh, just after the shooting or just before? Uh, evidently, just immediately. Because he, he, was, he was looking, you know, whenever I got the camera focused and then I snapped it in my picture, he slumped over. What type of picture was this? It's a Polaroid picture. Um, about how close were you? Uh, how close? How many feet? 15, 10? Oh, fairly close. 10 or 15 foot. Uh, no more because that's where I had my camera. This, this was right at the underpass? Yes, just a few feet from the underpass, you know. Were you up on that grassy bank there? Yes, that's where we were, and I stepped out in the street. We were right at the car. Uh-huh. She, she hollered. Did you uh, see uh, any uh, suspicious person in connection yeah, of with... of course, I, I was just, uh, you know, doing it with my camera. And uh, when I took that, well, the shots had rang out, and I wasn't... Looking around. Uh, uh, right. how, how many shots did you hear? You say shots rang out. Uh, oh, I don't know. I think three or four is what I, I, uh, that I heard uh -huh. that, I was, that I'm sure of. Now, I don't know. There might have been more. It just takes seconds for me to realize what was happening. Yeah, uh, what was your first thought? Uh, that those were shots and yeah. that he has been hit. Uh -huh. And that they're not to hit me because I'm right at the car, so I... The for me to get on the ground. So, uh, uh, what, uh, how did the uh, president respond to uh, the shot? I mean, did he just slump suddenly? Or? Yes, he grabbed his chest, and of course, uh, Mrs. Kennedy jumped up immediately and fell over him. And uh, she says, My daughter, he's been shot. Did you notice any other reaction to persons around him? around the president in the motorcade there at the time of the shot? Oh, uh, they hesitated just for a moment because I think they were like, I was, you know, was that a shot? Is that that fire or just what? And then, of course, uh, he touched himself and they immediately set up real uh -huh. fast, you know, like to get out of there. And uh, of the police, there were several motorcycles around him and uh, they stopped and uh, one or two must have went with him and one ran up the hill and the friend that was with me ran up the hill across the street you know, from where the shots came from. Did it they, was just confusion then. Did the reports of the shot, in other words, the sound of the explosions, did they sound uh, rather loud? Yes, they did. Just like a firecracker going uh, off that at the car. Seemed, uh, seemed fairly close by. Yes. Uh -huh. And from what direction did it seem to be? Uh, oh, just right there at me. Uh, just, just right at you? That's, uh, yeah. 
Two eyewitnesses to the murdered president who saw on his face the anguish of his very last hour alive. Before we go back to CBS, here again are some uh, announcements of special local importance. Out of respect to the death of Mr. Kennedy, the Dallas Civic Opera has now postponed their performance to tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Sunday's performance has been changed from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. That's the latest about the opera. The opera tomorrow night, not tonight, 8 p.m., and Sunday's change from afternoon matinee to 8 p.m. at night. And the combined major stores in Dallas are closing at once out of respect to the late president. They will remain closed this evening and be open at the regular time in the morning. The balloon parade scheduled uh, tomorrow morning canceled. Potentate E.D. M- M- Malone has called off the annual appreciation dinner of the Hella Temple Shrine that was to have been held tonight at the Holiday Inn. And here's about some of the high school basketball games tonight. The Woodrow Wilson South Oak Cliff high school uh, playoff game scheduled for tonight at Cobb Stadium has been postponed until Saturday night, tomorrow night. Also, the Carrollton Castleberry game postponed until 7.30 Saturday night. The Richardson-Denton game at Richardson also has been postponed. Now, these two games will be played. The Highland Park Sherman High School game in Sherman will be played tonight. The Grand Prairie Wichita Falls game at Grand Prairie also will be played as scheduled tonight. The Wichita Falls team was already en route and they have decided to go on with that game. This is KRLD News. Now back to CBS. 
We take you now to Parkland Hospital in Dallas for an announcement by the attending physician to Governor John Connolly. When you start off here is the doctor who has been attending Texas Governor John Connolly. I'm Dr. Robert R. Shaw, Professor of Thoracic Surgery at Southwestern Medical School. Because of this position, I accepted the responsibility of taking care of Governor Connolly. Professor of Thoracic Surgery at Southwestern Medical School. Because of my position, I accepted the responsibility of taking care of Governor Connolly uh, following his injury. I want to say at the outset that the condition of the governor is quite satisfactory in view of the injury that he has sustained. He seemed to have been struck by just one bullet which entered the right posterior chest close to the shoulder blade and coursed downward along the chest wall, taking out and fragmenting a portion of the fifth rib on the right. The bullet then emerged from the chest, evidently struck his right wrist, fracturing the lower portion of the right radius, and then entered the left thigh where it was spent. The thigh wound is trivial. The fracture of the radius should heal without difficulty or without further disability. Our major problem was the sucking wound of the right chest wall because in making the wound of the chest, the fragments of the fifth rib became what we refer to as secondary missiles and these caused a considerable amount of tissue damage in the point where the missile emerged from the chest. When the wound had been enlarged in order to remove damaged tissue, the lung could be inspected. It was found that there was a tear in the middle lobe of the lung, which had to be repaired. There was also a small hole in the lower lobe, undoubtedly due to a small rib fragment. This was of no consequence. The major problem was a matter of completely controlling all bleeding points, removing all damaged muscle and tissue, and then securing a tight closure of the chest wall so that the right lung could be re-expanded. The governor's condition was good during all of this. He was perfectly lucid before anesthesia was started. And from what we know about his injury and his condition at the present time, we have no reason to believe that he won't completely recover without significant disability of any sort. The length of time that he will be in the hospital will be determined more by the clearing of the bruise to the right lung, and I would estimate that this would be in the neighborhood of 10 to 14 days. This doesn't mean that this injury will be completely clear by this time, but at least we should have a good idea as to the trend of the clearing. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard a statement from Parkland Hospital from the attending physician to Governor John Connolly. We now return to the CBS network feed on the president's assassination today in Dallas. And Alan, we have news now of another member of the Kennedy family, Mrs. Peter Lawford, sister of the president, and we'll get it from Murray Fromson of KNX reporting from Santa Monica. This is Patricia.
Patricia Lawford, one of the late president's sisters, was home alone here in Santa Monica today when she heard of Mr. Kennedy's death over radio. Reportedly, she is taking the news reasonably well, considering its gravity. Two of her four children have been brought home from school, and Mrs. Lawford is playing with them in the front room. They are too young, aged four and three, obviously, to grab the portent of the news. A flag is flying at the front of the home at half-mast. Actor Peter Lawford, who has been at a nightclub act at Lake Tahoe in Nevada, has chartered an airplane and is flying south to rejoin his wife. Mrs. Lawford has had several visitors this morning. A priest, a doctor, two nuns, her husband's business agent, and Judy Garland. No word yet when the Lawfords will go east. A half a dozen police are guarding the Lawford home, and a platoon of newsmen are keeping an eye on it as well. The president visited here several times, both as the senator and as the nation's chief executive. Once he gave Secret Service agents a fit, taking a dip in the Pacific Ocean, which is to the front of the home. It was a hot Sunday afternoon two years ago, and 100,000 people were on the sand, and Mr. Kennedy seemed to enjoy the informality of the occasion. It was one of many indications he was to give over the years of the disdain he held the security precautions surrounding him. This is Murray Frampson at the Lawford Home in Santa Monica. Back at the CBS News headquarters in New York, we now have the tape excerpt of the statement of shock expressed by New York's Governor Nelson Rockefeller. Let's hear that from our tape room. This is a shocking and terrible tragedy for the nation and the world. Mrs. Rockefeller and I join with all New Yorkers and every American in extending heartfelt sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and the President's family. May God grant strength and guidance to Lyndon Johnson as he assumes his grave responsibilities under these tragic circumstances. The prayers of all of us will be with him. I have proclaimed for the state of New York a 30-day period of mourning, and I have directed that all state offices shall be closed on the day of the president's funeral. New York's Governor Nelson Rockefeller as he expressed shock at the assassination of President Kennedy. President Lyndon Johnson will make his first statement as the nation's new chief executive at Andrews Air Force Base when the presidential jet arrives from Dallas in just about a half an hour from now. And after that statement, President Johnson will fly to the White House aboard a helicopter where he will meet with Defense Secretary McNamara and McGeorge Bundy, who was special assistant to President Kennedy on national security affairs. Later this evening... The new president will confer with both Democratic and Republican leaders of the House and the Senate. At the time of the president's death, a red, white, and blue presidential plane was flying over the Pacific, heading to Tokyo, carrying Secretary of State Dean Rusk and five other Kennedy cabinet members to Tokyo for a meeting. The word was received of the president's death from our Pacific military commander, Admiral Harry Felt who called the plane by radio telephone and gave the first word of President Kennedy's assassination. Secretary of State Rusk, upon hearing the news, said simply, we are turning around. And the plane did turn around and has flown back to Honolulu. And soon the presidential party will be back on its way to Washington for the funeral. Inevitably, Alan, people will be turning their minds back to the events of 1960 when Lyndon Johnson fought so hard and so vigorously for the Democratic presidential nomination, only to lose out in the end to the man whom he has now succeeded because of the assassination of John Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy's election in 1960 was by the closest popular vote margin of any election in this century. Republican leaders at the time said that Lyndon Johnson's effectiveness in holding the South played a large part in the defeat of the Republican ticket headed by Vice President Richard M. Nixon and Henry Cabot Lodge, who had resigned from his post at the United Nations in order to make the race. The electoral vote in November 1960 was 300 for Kennedy and Johnson, 223 for Nixon and Lodge, 269 were needed to elect. Mr. Johnson had been mentioned as a possible presidential candidate long before he actually became one in 1960. There was widespread speculation in 1954 in Washington and elsewhere that he was in fact aiming at the White House. But Senator Johnson scoffed at the idea then, and he said, talk of my being a potential candidate is a lot of foolishness. I have no interest, no ambition in that direction. I am conscious of my limitations. I think it's fair to say that nobody but my mama ever thought I'd get as far as I did. But the talk persisted, and his presidential stock took a dramatic upsurge in 1956 when Texas voters gave him a landslide victory over Governor Alan Shivers in a battle for control of the Democratic Party in that state. 
That was one year after Mr. Johnson had suffered a fairly severe heart attack, which took him out of action for several weeks. But later on, he staged a complete recovery from that heart attack, and since then, there's been no sign of anything but good health on the part of the vice president. Well, as you know, I've been uh, somewhat curious at the strange lack of any information on the suspect or suspects who have been picked up in connection with the assassination. We've been told that Fort Worth police are questioning one young man in connection with the assassination, and the Dallas police are holding another in connection with the shooting of a Dallas policeman near the same area this afternoon. But beyond that, very little has been announced as to what's what's happening. It's a very peculiar circumstance. We did hear a a while ago that the uh, building where the fatal shots were fired had been surrounded by police, but uh, there's been no actual announcement that anyone was arrested in that building. That is right. Uh, There's also the amazingly accurate marksmanship of the assassin who, if he did, as apparently he did, shoot from the fifth or sixth floor of this building, killed the president apparently with one bullet. He actually, the doctors say, apparently was hit twice, but it was the first bullet that made at least two wounds. And the doctors who treated him say that the president lost consciousness as soon as he was hit and never revived. And they said they never had any hope of saving his life. He was hit about 125 Eastern time, and he died just 35 minutes later. This is amazing accuracy for an assassin. Especially at a moving target. Yes, indeed. And he fired three shots, so far as anybody has been able to tell, and he hit Governor Connolly twice and President Kennedy once or twice. Well, obviously, he's a, he's a marksman and a sharpshooter, whoever he is. But it is amazing, as you say. Apparently, the first shot was directed at the president. Uh, that seems to have been the... Uh, the gist of what eyewitnesses have said, that the first, that when the first shot was fired, the president uh, was hit, and then the uh, second, probably the third shots, were fired at the governor. There was that strange series of wounds suffered by the governor from one of the bullets, as the doctors have reported, that the one bullet hit him in the chest, breaking at least one or more ribs, then tore a wound into his thigh, and finally ended up injuring his wrist, which was a highly volatile bullet to go that far before it finally stopped. Obviously, it was a well-planned assassination. It wasn't any spur-of-the-moment affair. Uh, When you think back to the uh, assassination attempt on President-elect Roosevelt in 1933, uh, this man was simply waiting in the crowd, hoping to get a chance at at, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And when the president came along with Mayor Cermak of Chicago, he simply opened fire on him, uh, and it was... Apparently, he wasn't in any position to uh, to wait carefully, as this man obviously did today in Dallas, Texas. We are going to switch again from our CBS News headquarters uh, for a for a personal eyewitness account of what happened today in Dallas, Texas, and we'll hear from CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint. In retrospect, what seems to come back most strongly about this tragic day is the bitter irony of it. How everything was going so well for the president and Mrs. Kennedy until that awful moment. The president seemed to be doing fine, speaking easily to large, friendly crowds. He himself was in very good spirits, and even Mrs. Kennedy seemed to be thoroughly enjoying this unofficial politicking that they'd been doing here in Texas. As we drove into Dallas about noon today, the crowds were friendly, enthusiastic, and much larger than we'd expected. The motorcade down Main Street was as good as any of the president's supporters could have hoped. Of course, it had been expected that there would be some signs of the deeply conservative opposition to the president that prevails in much of this town, and we did see a few anti-Kennedy signs, but not very many. At about 12.30, as the motorcade turned off Main Street around a small park, I heard a couple of explosions, maybe three. I couldn't be sure at the time. The president's car at the head of the motorcade was just going under an overpass of some kind before entering a freeway. It seemed to pause briefly, then suddenly it speeded up and disappeared. Maybe the words of Mrs. John Connolly, wife of the governor, are the best description here. She was sitting in the car with the president, the governor, and Mrs. Kennedy. Mrs. Connolly says she had just turned to talk to the president about what a great reception the Kennedys were getting in Dallas. You can't say Dallas isn't friendly to you today, Mrs. Connolly told the president. And those were probably the last words he ever heard. The first shot hit him in the throat just by the Adam's apple. Mrs. Connolly says her husband, the governor, who was sitting in a jump seat just in front of the president, turned back to look at him 
and was himself hit by at least one bullet. Mrs. Connolly says she never heard the president utter a sound. That Mrs. Kennedy immediately gathered him in her arms as Mrs. Connolly turned to help her own critically wounded husband. The Secret Service man in the front seat beside the driver immediately seized the phone and said, let's go straight to the nearest hospital. That was Parkland Memorial, only a few blocks away. As the president's car arrived at the emergency entrance to the hospital, the president himself was stretched across the back seat, his head cradled in Mrs. Kennedy's arms. He had blood across the front of his suit and was completely motionless as he was lifted onto a wheeled stretcher. And Mrs. Kennedy, her pink suit showing the blood of her husband, walked beside the wheeled cart into the hospital. Despite the desperate efforts of eight or ten doctors, there was little that could be done. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m., probably without ever having felt or even heard the single shot that ended his life. This is Robert Pierpoint in Dallas. Now we have another signal here. We're going to switch now to CBS News correspondent Charles Von Fremd at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. Here at Andrews Field, we believe Air Force One, the presidential plane, the big four-engine fan jet 707 that carries the President of the United States, has just arrived, bearing with it the body of former President Kennedy, also President Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, and the bereaved widow, Mrs. Kennedy. We say believe because the plane came in ahead of schedule. And just as it touched down, all the lights here at the landing ramp went off. But now the plane is taxiing up into sight. It certainly belongs to the fleet of Air Force planes that belong to the White House. And I do believe that this is Air Force One. It is pulling into position on the ramp. We've been told that President Johnson can be expected to make a few brief comments before he leaves the Air Force. And now we can see what we believe to be a coffin containing the body of President Kennedy being moved from Air Force One onto a special enclosed ramp, a mobile ramp, which was drawn up to the back door. Yes, we can make out the casket now. A very solemn group of officials huddled down at the bottom of that ramp. We can make out Dave Powers, the longtime friend of former President Kennedy, a friendship that goes back to the days when Mr. Kennedy was then aspiring to be a first-term member of the House of Representatives. Now an honor guard slowly paces off the steps on the ground below the enclosed ramp, which contains the remains of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Off to one side, we see Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara hastily conferring with some aides with General Maxwell Taylor. Now the ramp is being slowly lowered to the ground, containing the casket. And a gray U.S. Navy ambulance has pulled into sight and is now directly in front of the ramp in which the casket still rests. There is some confusion here at the moment, which is understandable. This tragic day could not be rehearsed. We still have not seen President Johnson's wife or Mrs. Kennedy. Perhaps they are in the back of that ramp. We can only see a few individuals at the very front. Now the casket is being removed from the ramp. job, but the men who have this sorry task do it with tremendous dignity. One of the most moving moments that any reporter can expect to see. Standing in the ramp now is the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, and I believe the yes, that's Mrs. Kennedy, the President's wife, now being helped down off the ramp. The casket has been moved into the U.S. Navy ambulance. Other members from a distance, it's hard to make them out. We can see Associate Press Secretary Andrew Hatcher hopping down off the ramp. Mrs. Kennedy, with her chin up, walks to the back door of the ambulance. Without aid. And now there's a cluster of officials around the ambulance which contains the remains 
of former President Kennedy who was assassinated earlier today. We see James Rowley, the chief of White House Secret Service, pale and shaken, calling for other Secret Service agents to come over quickly. We can't make out who he is trying to talk to. We don't recognize President Johnson yet. I'm sure he's someplace in that turmoil. He needs Air Force One. A plane that had carried former President Kennedy on many historic journeys to Europe and to the Berlin Wall, to Latin America, among other places. And on so many friendly visits to places like Palm Beach and his favorite retreat of all, Hyannisport and Cape Cod. That plane has carried him for the last time. <laughs>